Well, these cattle here have just found themselves in a salad bar. They're in this pasture that's got a dozen or more different species in here at different stages of growth with different contributions to their diet. Some of these plants are really high in nitrogen, some are high in fibre, and the cattle are able to pick and choose what they want to eat to suit their particular requirements. The beauty of having uh, such long uh, pasture is that much of this pasture is going to get trampled or fouled on by the stock themselves. The thinking in a regenerative grazing situation is a third of the pasture goes to the animal, a third of the pasture gets trampled, and a third of the pasture remains to promote rapid regrowth after that pulse of grazing goes through. This paddock was grazed off about 10 or 12 days ago. It had about uh, four or five tons of dry matter per hectare. And this is the, probably not quite a third that's left. And some of the things that I wanted to point out here is the impact of the cattle's hooves pushing this material into intimate contact with the soil. So you can see here, particularly in this depression, the amount of material that's still remaining on the surface of the soil. Uh, so when we talk about the third that's left, we're talking about the live and dead material. So this material that's pushed in here in intimate contact with the soil is already being colonized by the soil microbiota. They're already working to break that down. So part of the nutrient cycling post-grazing is the, the, the deposition of manure on top of the uh, remaining pasture as well. And here we have uh, a small cow pat. And don't forget the cow pat has got high levels of uh, available nutrient in it as well. So the available nutrient in the cow pat is available to the soil microorganisms to assist with the breakdown of material that has been kept here in a nice little environment of constant moisture, constant temperature, which is exactly what the soil microorganisms uh, um, need for optimal function. And this is a beautiful example of dung beetle activity. And we've got the lovely contrast between the red soil that underlies this cow pat. And we can see the hole here of the large winter active dung beetle who has excavated the soil for its burrow. And of course, then it's drawing this manure down deep into the root zone. So a key focus of grazing management in a regenerative system is managing for productivity and soil health. When we see pastures that are heavily overgrazed, we know that they have really small root systems and there's very little return going back into the soil from the plant. So we're trying to use the plant to pump energy into the soil, to pump energy into the soil in the form of sugars, which are firing up soil biology, nutrient cycling, and all the other functions that we've been talking about. We want to keep our grass in a vegetative state, so we're using our stock to graze the pasture down as evenly as we can. We're using large stock numbers to apply that grazing pressure, graze the pasture down, ensure really good pasture utilization, and then get the stock off. Now, this means moving the stock fairly regularly. In a dairy situation, we might be moving the stock a couple of times a day, but in a beef uh, operation, we still need to move the animals pretty regularly, and that might be in every day, every two days, depending very much on the size of the paddock, the size of the mob, and the degree of grazing pressure that we're able to apply to that. And then we want to give that pasture as a, a substantial rest to allow those plants to recover fully before we bring the stock back in again. So we've talked about the principle of regenerative grazing being eating a third, leaving a third, and tromping a third. And whilst we want good pasture utilization, we've got to think about how we adapt this approach to sensitive areas. Sensitive areas being very steep country, um, wet areas, north facing slopes, and how we adapt our approach to manage the potential impact on these areas, maybe retaining a higher residual so that we've got a bigger plant and bigger root systems holding very steep slopes together, or the use of lighter stock, so young stock, sheep, but the emphasis at all times is maintaining a good, healthy, 
permanent ground cover to protect the surface of the soil. We're probably all familiar with the David Attenborough scenes from Africa of all the different animals that exist on the Great Serengeti Plains. Not that I'm comparing this location to, to, uh, to the Serengeti Plains, but I want to make the point that landscapes can accommodate a whole range of different animals because they all feed a bit differently. They feed on different parts of the pasture, they feed on different heights in the pasture, they'll graze it down to different depths in the pasture. Uh, and on top of that, the different uh, weight and size of the animal's feet are going to be pushing uh, material into the surface of the soil uh, to different degrees. So most typically on Australian farms, we see cattle and sheep. But the role of other animals in regenerative agriculture is beginning to expand now, and we're seeing roles for poultry, ducks, chickens, geese. They're eating different parts of the pasture. They're following on from the animals and cleaning up and spreading manures. And all animals' manures have got different characteristics. Some are higher in more degradable compounds, some are more resistant to degradation. So for example, if we have chickens following cattle, cattle manure is a good soil conditioner, but it hasn't got a really high proportion of readily available nutrient. In contrast, chicken manure is a very readily available uh, form of fertilizer. So having chickens coming through after cattle and spreading a lot of chicken manure as well as physically spreading the cattle manure is having a strong fertilizer value to help that pasture spring back after grazing. <laughs>